there's something else. Welcome to everybody. Thanks for coming out. We're having a fantastic time at the Fifth Hope. Um, I know it's a little tight in here. I know it's a little hot. I got a couple of small requests, and uh, the fellows in the orange shirts, everyone's volunteer in the conference, the fellows in the orange shirts are the security volunteers. They're going to they're gonna be following up by uh, asking for, uh, for this. We, uh, what we need are two things. One is for people with the, uh, the cameras, the tripods uh, from the press to go to the center post, third post there, and back, please. The other thing that we need is um, an aisle for fire exit on this side. I know a lot of people are standing over there. We're going to be going through and asking you to try to either scoot in or uh, scoot back or scoot otherwise. And I apologize. I know it's difficult. I know it's hot and so forth. Um, but we're all trying to be uh, polite and helpful. And thanks for your cooperation. That's the introduction to the introduction. Um, as you know, let me just tell you where we're at. We're Friday keynote. We got Saturday and Sunday still to come. We got 24-hour movie room. We're just about to put a sign up. It was downstairs. We're moving it to the Madison room. We got a third track unscheduled. If you'd like to sign up, you got something to say, sign up, give a talk, give a tutorial, give a workshop. 24-hour access there for um, a third track workshop. Uh, Lockpick session is, uh, I think, done for this afternoon. We're going to be having more lockpick workshops. Stay tuned tomorrow for announcements about those uh, times and places. So we have a lot of things going on, as well as uh, a live broadcast of off the, hope, uh, off the Hook in this room from 8 till 10 p.m., and continued sessions in this room and the other room throughout. A lot of excitement going on. Now to uh, provide the real introduction, Emmanuel Goldstein. Wow. This is amazing. Look at this, all the way back to the end. Um, welcome. Welcome to the Fifth Hope. We're here. Uh, I just got to say, this marks the culmination of months of work with a very dedicated group of people. Uh, the decorations, I think, have been absolutely amazing. Uh, second floor, 18th floor. Uh, AV, we've scrambled to put together a team and uh, it's working out great. Uh, I just want to give a hand to all those people and security for keeping things working. Thank you. And there's a couple of reminders to folks, just make sure that um, as, we, as we ask for the uh, aisle to be kept clean, uh, keep the hotel happy. Everyone's been behaving great so far and uh, we just want to keep that up. Uh, they've been really good to us and um, I think the weekend is going great. Uh, compared to the last hope, I think we're already, uh, we, we have more people, or getting close to more people in the whole weekend. Uh, and we have so much more to come. We have the Off the Hook show later tonight. We have uh, Steve Wozniak tomorrow. Jell will be out for Sunday. Uh, but now, for today, we have something that we have never been able to have before. Because back in uh, the first hope, back in 1994, Kevin was in prison. And uh, after that, he actually, no, 1994, he was on the run. 1997, he was in prison. And then there was, there was always a reason for Kevin not to be here, but there's no more reason for him not to, uh, not to be here. So he is here finally. This is, this is the culmination. And it's the reason we started the Hope Conference in the first place, to get Kevin Mitnick to New York. And well, we did it. Uh, I also just want to intro a couple of really special people. Uh, Kevin's mother and grandmother are here. I think it's, and, Throughout, throughout the entire ordeal of, of Kevin's imprisonment and prosecution, they have been the, 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 uh, the strength behind uh, everything. Uh, as far as Kevin standing up to, for his rights, just knowing that there are people out here supporting him, they've always been there, and they've been a real inspiration to me too. Just people who really understand what's going on, what he is accused of, what he did, what's unfair about it. And it's just, I think that makes all the difference when you have people who, who give a damn, who are standing behind you. So I just wanna, I wanna thank you two for being there and for being here. And, and we can also say Kevin is the only uh, hacker to bring his mom and grandmother to a conference. <laughs> all right. And with that, the words I've been wanting to speak for 10 years, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Mitnick. 
Thanks, Thanks Art. Sorry, man. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> it's finally good to be home. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for showing up for my talk. It's uh, great to be back home again. And uh, I want to thank everyone for all their support they've given me over the years. And today, my talk is going to be a little bit different. I usually talk for companies and conventions and stuff like that, but I'm going to talk about me and uh, the stuff that I've been through and where I'm going and some entertaining stories I think everyone will relate to and enjoy. And uh, I guess I am the only first hacker to bring my mom and grandmother to a conference, so uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Anyway, I think I was born, oh, by, by the way, my talk is going to be last for about probably an hour, 15 minutes to an hour and a half, and I'm going to have a 30-minute Q&A, just so everyone's aware of the time constraints here. I think I was uh, born as a hacker because at 10 years old, I was fascinated with magic. I love illusions. And I would hang out at the corner magic store for hours and hours just to find out the secret to a magic trick. I always wanted a bite of the forbidden fruit, the forbidden apple, and I always was in pursuit of information that should be secret but for entertainment. I loved doing illusions. I loved uh, pulling pranks on friends and family. So about two years later, the first system I hacked wasn't a computer, wasn't a telephone, but was the Los Angeles RTD. You know what RTD is? Uh, the Rapid Tr Transit District. So as a young kid, I, I, my hobby was riding buses. I was used to like ride buses around all the way through Los Angeles and San Bernardino. My mom worked uh, long hours as a single mother supporting me, so Kevin had to find something entertaining to do. So one day I'm sitting at the back of the bus, and I'm looking at the transfer. You know how you could pay a certain fee and you can buy a transfer to transfer on a different line? I'm looking at it, and it has a, a special punch, and it's punched with a date and the direction you're going. And you could use this as a ticket to get on the next bus. So I'm thinking to myself, about 11, 11 and a half years old, this is kind of interesting. So I go up to the bus driver as I'm about to get off the bus. And I go, hey, sir, um, where do you get these punches? I'm doing a special project for school. And I like the kind of shapes these are. These are really cool shapes. Where can I buy one of these punches? And he told me uh, the name of the store in downtown Los Angeles. I get that was the first time I did social engineering, 11 years old. <laughs> so I go to the store in downtown LA, and I buy myself a nice shiny punch. And I go, wow, this is cool. I can punch my own transfers. The problem was is I didn't have any transfers. So I was thinking my grandmother lived about uh, two miles away from the RTD bus depot. And I was thinking, you know, human nature, people are lazy. So I think these bus drivers, probably after a long day of riding that bus, they take these transfers they haven't used and they just throw it in the trash. So Kevin at 11 and a half became a dumpster diver. <laughs> and I went into the RTD trash and fished out all these blank transfers. And I used to punch my own transfers and ride the bus system. Bus drivers knew what I was doing because they'd see me boarding the bus and I'd have the outline of the punch, right? <laughs> and and that would be so bold sometimes to punch another transfer on the bus for somebody else. <laughs> and, and the driver thought it was cute, right? <laughs> Everyone thought it was cute. No one told me I was defrauding RTD, right? <laughs> and I guess I have a little bit of a photographic memory because I actually ended up memorizing the entire schedule for every bus in Los Angeles County. So if I knew I had to go from point A to point B, I knew what time to be at what place without referencing any type of schedule. So uh, that was kind of interesting. One day I was riding the bus and I met this other guy who was a ham radio operator. And this bus driver says, hey, uh, hey kid, I found this radio on, on the back of a bus. Do you know what it is? And he handed up, hold it up, held up an HT, Motorola HT, and I go, oh, that's a police radio, I'm thinking. Well, that's cool, I'd like to listen to police. <laughs> And he goes, no, this is a ham radio. So he introduced me to the, uh, to the hobby of amateur radio. And I was so intrigued, not with the radio, but of the auto patch capability. That's making phone calls over radio. I thought the auto patch was cool. I could have this little HT handheld. This is like 20 years ago, and I could dial any phone number. And I thought that was, wow, I want to be able to do that, right? So 
I won't go into my auto patch stories, that will be for the next talk. But my most, the most fun I had with a radio, before I get into phones and computers, was the drive up windows at McDonald's. Because <laughs> you can clip a wire in some sort of the, certain, uh, certain radios like the Alinko radio and you can go out of band and transfer on any, uh, transmit on any frequency. So we used to have fun at McDonald's. So the driver, customer drive up to the drive up window and we now become the McDonald's employee because we have more power. Can I take your order, sir? Yes, I'd like a Big Mac, large fry, large Coke. Oh, I'm sorry, we're, we have changed our menu and now we offer super taco, burritos, <laughs> and we don't offer any, any sodas anymore, it's only juices. We drive customers crazy. Even to the point, and don't forget we're young at this time, right? So we're a little bit crazy. We actually, tape with a micro cassette tape recorder, record ourselves like, well, one of us recorded ourselves urinating in the toilet, so you have the sound on tape. <laughs> Driver comes up. Yes, sir, may I help you? Yes, I'd like to get a Big Mac and a large, a large soda. Well, sir, we're, we only have apple juice today, and our ice machine's broken. But we, we could get you a large apple juice, and it's on the house. Would you like that? Oh, yes, sir, okay. Well, hold on, is that small, or, you know, small, medium, or large, and we play the tape, right? <laughs> we drove one McDonald's so crazy that the manager came out, we're, we're, we're like a block away doing this, right? Manager comes out, he's looking in the parking lot, he sees no one, right? And he's looking around and he's scratching his head and he walks up to the speaker, right? And he has his face on the speaker and I go, what the F are you looking at? This guy, <laughs> this guy dropped back 30 feet. <laughs> Don't tell the FCC on me, they already don't like me. <laughs> so let's uh, fast forward a little bit to high school. I'm a ham radio buff, I'm really into radio, I'm into playing with the auto patch, and I meet this other kid whose dad's a ham radio operator, and he was a, what they call the phone freak. So he wanted to borrow my radio in exchange for showing me stuff about phones, and I, I could really care less at the time. But then he started showing me some neat stuff, how he can call a secret number in the phone company and he can give the phone number, and the operator would get, immediately give the name and address without asking any questions. It was called the CNA Bureau. How he was able, he'd say, give me the name of a, a family member that has an unlisted telephone. And he would call, the, uh, call a bureau called the NumPub Bureau. And he'd be able to sweet talk them out of getting an unlisted telephone number of a family member. Then the really thing that intrigued me is he said, I have this secret test number. You call this test number, you hear a tone, and you put in five digits, and you can call anywhere in the world for free. Later on, I found out that was Sprint. And it wasn't calling for someone for free. Somebody was paying the bill, but I'm a you know, high school kid. I didn't know. So it, when I started in phones, it was really learning about the telephone network. I had a, a passion for technology. It was just, it was fascinating. And the people I read about, like uh, John Draper, Captain Crunch, who I know is here, and Steve Wozniak, I read about their uh, um, uh, experiments in, with the phone system. And it kind of intrigued me. And I wanted to learn more, more, and more. So. The route I took was a very risky route. And this is where I first learned about social engineering because to learn about the phone company wasn't like you can go down and get a manual. I did read the, the, uh, the Bell Technical Journals at UCLA Library, that was pretty cool. But a lot of it was about pretending to be another employee, calling up another department within the phone company and sweet talking them of how to do something. Like I have this customer's phone was uh, disconnected by mistake, how do I reconnect it? and then learning about their internal operations. That's where I first learned about social engineering back in the uh, late 70s. But then I got a little bit more bold than that. I, wanted, I was really wanted to learn about you know, the equipment, how it worked. So a late one night, around one in the morning, I guess it's an action I still regret today, is a friend of mine who was also a phone freaker at the time decided we're gonna take a self-guided tour of the Hollywood Gower Central Office in Hollywood, California. So we acquired the door code. So we're in the central office, and we're walking around. It's a nine-story building. And when I get to the fifth floor, this big, bulky security guard says, son, uh, yes. Uh, he goes, who are you? Oh, well, this is Adam. I'm, I'm with the Cosmo Center in San Diego. I'm just taking my friend here on a little tour of phone company. He's kind of interested. And my, my friend looked 15 years old. He says, do you have a you badge? I go, yeah, sure, no problem. And I go to my wallet. And I go, oh man, I just left in my car, uh, I'll go get up, I'll be right back. He goes, no, no, you come with me. Brings me up to the ninth floor, and then there's other people there. And they go, who are you? 
who do you work for, the 20 questions. And I'm calm as can be, work in the Cosmos Center, here's the address, who's your supervisor, give him the name of a supervisor, because I already had memorized this information from before. So he goes, well, I'm going to call your supervisor right now. I go, well, it's 2 in the morning. She's going to get pretty pissed off. He goes, well, you don't have any idea. We don't know who you are. Okay, call the supervisor. He gets on the phone. He, call, he gets the supervisor's home phone number, calls her at home, wakes her up, and says, yeah, I have one of your uh, employees here named Adam, and he's giving a, a tour at 2 in the morning? What's going on with this? And she somehow thought, she goes, oh, yeah, I do have an Adam working for me. And then I said to the gentleman, the security guy, I said, well, look, can I talk to my boss? So he goes, sure. And he hands me the phone. And I go, oh, hi. And, and we're talking. She's going, who are you? And I say, yeah, I, I am sorry that he interrupted your sleep. And I will have that report you know, Tuesday morning. And you know, how, how's, how'd your vacation go? And she's going, who are you? What's your name? Who are you? And I'm having a call. And I'm pressing it to my ear so they can't hear her side, right? <laughs> And I said, great, well, I'll, I'll see you Monday. Uh, have a good day. And I hang up the phone. <laughs> and I know I have 10 minutes to get out of there. So I call him and go, I see, I told you who I was. I'm really sorry I didn't have my badge. Can you just, I'll just be another half hour. Can I show my friend around the building? And OK, go ahead. So we, we go, and instead of going on a self-guided tour, I decided to make a beeline right out of that building, go to the elevator down, out. And my friend and I sit in a car across the street, and we're just watching the door. About 15 minutes later, that same guard bursts out of the door, and he's looking all around. <laughs> Crazy stuff. I mean, I caused so much, I guess, uh, such a pain in the ass to the phone company that they eventually had to take out our telephone. I was at home living with my mom as a teenager, and the phone company actually removed our phone. Can you imagine that? They said, no phone for Mitnick. <laughs> and I was thinking, I go, this is not fair. So I lived in Unit 13, and they actually had it blocked off at line assignment, which is a special division of the phone company, no phone. So, okay. So I call up their uh, facilities department, and, and I tell them, there's a new unit being installed, 12B. <laughs> okay. So someone might move into 12B shortly, so you just should allocate it if they need service. Uh, in, you know, they, a customer might install a phone there. I wait about three days. I go to the hardware store, go get 12B. Take off 13, <laughs> put on 12B. <laughs> phone company was not happy. About three months later, they figured it out. They, they yanked out that phone again. <laughs> I think anyone in that apartment building, they'd have to go through security before they could get a phone line. I don't know why these guys don't have a sense of humor. So, let's, so I'm in high school. I'm really into phones, into switching and learning how this stuff worked. And that's when the phone company was going from step-by-step -step to crossbar to ESS, electronic switching systems. And computers kind of were the front ends that controlled these, uh, these devices. And I like to pull pranks on friends, so I always like to get access to the switch electronically. So when I was in high school, this friend introduced me to the computer instructor and, and tried to get me in the class. And the instructor goes, well, do you have trigonometry? What, what are your prerequisites? I go, no, I didn't have those uh, mathematical prerequisites, but I'd still like to take class. Can you let me in? He goes, well, and then my friend, my friend says, oh, show me some of that phone freaking stuff. I go, cool. So I start showing the teacher some of the cute things I could do with the phone, and he waves the prerequisites, right? So I go, oh, that's cool. So first assignment, write a basic program that finds the first 100, 100 Fibonacci numbers. <laughs> Boring. I decided I, I, my first program was to write a login simulator. So when the teacher would dial up to the PDP-11 off-site, he'd be talking to my program instead of the operating system and giving me the password that he was using. <laughs> and it would store his password in the file and would go ahead and log him in. And every time I'd go up to him and give him his new password, it would drive him crazy. <laughs> Even to the point he'd put it on paper tape, like the password, the six-character password. This is the RISTA C operating system for all your old timers out here. And then every day I'd remember the, the configuration of the holes, and you know, write it down, I'd get friends, oh, what, what's the second line we write down? Then we'd figure out the password, right? So I got bored with it. They had an HP 2000 at school, and a lot of us used to play games like Star Trek, Zork, Adventure. But USC always had the better games. And our modem at the school, we had an Olivetti 110 baud terminal. So to dial up to the school, can you imagine 110 baud these days? We couldn't dial outside. We could only dial within the campus. 
So what I used to do is call the operator, hi, this is Mr. Christ. I'm trying to get an outside line. Can you connect me to such and such number? And then I'd be able to dial into a USC. And we'd be able to play the games they had on their computers. So the teacher got wind of this because it was a teletype terminal. He'd go back on the paper and go, what are you up to again, Kevin? And it'd drive him crazy. So one day he walks into class and he announces, he gets everyone together and goes, I found the solution to stop Kevin. <laughs> and he holds up a telephone lock. And this is a dial telephone. And he proudly places the lock in the number one position. He has a big smile on his face. And I go, this is going to be fun. <laughs> so I go, Mr. Chris, what, what's the phone number to the, to the main school? I, I forgot what it was. And he proudly gives me the number. I said, hey, you want to see a neat trick? So I pick up the phone and I pulse out the number. He got so angry, the teacher, his face turned red, then it turned white, then he ripped out the phone and threw it across the room. <laughs> so, as you can see, I started off on a good foot. <laughs> All right. So my first hack, you know, people don't know, like, well, the first time I uh, hacked into a system, and I met the system admin, who was the administrator of the LAUSD, Los Angeles, Los Angeles Unified School District's computer, and these guys were really uh, clever with computers. These guys were, like, you know, true hackers. And I wanted, to, I wanted to learn from these guys, so I wanted to become a member of their peer group. And these guys were into hacking risk to see And they were into hacking different types of DEC operating systems. So they had a friend that worked for risk to see development, and they obtained the dial-up number to the, to the system. And this was the system where they did development on this operating system. So they said, they said, Kevin, if you can get into that system, you can join our group, and uh, we can share information. I'm thinking to myself, I don't know much about you know, hacking at the time. I, I don't know much about that particular operating system. All I have is dial-up number. What am I going to do, guess a password? This is what I was thinking to myself. So I did a little bit of research, and I found out one of the developer's names was Anton Chernoff. And I called the main number at DEC and found out the name of the person that was responsible for administra administrating the system. So I figured I'd give it a shot. I call up the system administrator. I go, hey, Greg, this is Anton. I said, what's going on with the system? He goes, what are you talking about? I said, I try to log into my account, uh, 1, 113, and it's not letting me, and I, I, have a, I have work to do. He goes, well, hold on a second. And he comes back, and he goes, you don't have 1, 113. You have this other account number. I said, no, I know I have that one, but I also have 1, 113 because I'm working on a special project. And I said, and he goes, and I go, what's going on? He goes, well, for some reason, it's, the account doesn't exist. I said, well, can you create it for me? I'm really in a rush. He goes, what password do you want? I go, jellyfish. Okay. He goes, okay, great. Uh, he goes, thank you. And I go, thank you. The call ends. I dial up. I'm all happy. I put in 1, 113. I put in jellyfish, and it says dial-up password. Oh, didn't know they had a dial-up password. So I call the guy back. And I go, what's up with the dial-up password? I, 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 did it change last month? He goes, yeah, didn't you get the email? I go, no. What's going on? He goes, it's buffoon. I go, okay, thanks. <laughs> That's a true story, it was buffoon. <laughs> so that was my, uh, my first hack into uh, DEC, and actually I was into their network for, for many, many years, and then I, uh, what my goal was as a, as a hacker was to find, I, what my goal was at the end of the day was everything was in the furtherance of becoming better at the skill of circumventing security, finding a way to pick the lock in the quickest way and the most effective way possible. And at the time, VMS, which is a different operating system manufactured by DEC, uh, was closed source. It's like Windows. Unless you uh, get the access to the source code they publish after ripping it off, you never will see it. Um, and what I did is I made another stupid decision in my life, and I figured, hey, I'm going to go get the VMS source code. So I end up getting the source code. I get it transferred to USC because I, I didn't have enough storage on my laptop to, to hold the whole source code tree. So I figured I'd leave it on USC, and I'll look through the code. It was Bliss32. And I'll look for uh, comments on any security patches that were applied, and they'd be able to work the patch backwards to what the hole was. Or I'd be able to identify holes that they haven't even figured out yet. So that was my goal. And I figured it'd be much safer for me to look through the source code tree on USC's computers than it would be on DEX. There was a less chance of detection. So my cohort that was working with me on this, another uh, fellow hacker that I met in high school, he routed me out to the feds. 
It's a long story. And then one day, he calls me up on the phone and says, listen, Kevin, I need you to come to my office. Uh, I, I, need, I need a couple of those disks that have some information that we worked on before. So one Friday night, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I drive down to his office and I go into the underground parking garage and surprisingly, he was like outside. And I go, hey, Lenny, come here. And he goes, oh, yeah, do you have your blue bag with you? I thought that was kind of weird. I go, yeah, I brought the disk. So I go into the trunk to get my disk, and then all of a sudden, all these cars start screeching, right? So it was a setup. It was a FBI. And uh, they promptly, promptly arrested me and took me down to Terminal Island Federal Prison in San Pedro, California. And all I was concerned about is how much is my bail, because I want to get out of here. So I stayed there the weekend. And uh, Monday morning, they take me down to the FBI office and they take photographs. Have you ever seen that electronic terrorist photograph that the, uh, the media loves to use? That was that photograph back in 1988. So they take me down, they take me down to court. And I'm thinking, finally, go to court, they'll set the bail, I'll get out, it will be a done story. So I show up at court and they introduce me to this public defender who spoke to me about for five minutes. And he didn't even know how to turn on a computer. The only question was, do you have a passport? I go, yeah, but uh, uh, my family will bring it if that's an issue. So we go into court. My family's there. I'm sitting down and I'm expecting bail to be posted. I'm out of here. Prosecutor stands up, goes, your honor, not only do we have to hold Mr. Mitnick in detention, but we have to make sure he can't get access to a telephone. Because if he can get access to a telephone, he could pick up the phone and call into NORAD, and he could whistle the codes to launch a nuclear weapon. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, I go, nobody could be that stupid. Right? Nobody could be that stupid. And your honor, we have evidence that Mr. Mitnick has compromised the security of the National Security Agency. And even though this hearing is open to the public, we feel comfortable we can discuss this. And so they found a, a file on one of those floppy disks called nsa.txt. And what I did, there was a system called DocMaster that was run by the National Computer Security Center, and I did a who is on it. Remember the old days how you'd be able to list out the registered users of the house? Well, I captured the output into a file called nsa.txt, and the prosecutor turned that into, I compromised the security of the National Security Agency. They talked about war games and how the movie War Games was probably based on what I could do, and they were scaring the heebie-jeebies out of this federal magistrate. So at the end of the day, the prosecutor asked for a special detention order that they keep me away from every electronic device in detention and no bail. And so they placed me in the only place they could put me, the hole, which is a solitary confinement. And I was in the hole for about nine months, I'd say about eight and a half months, and that's where you're locked down 23 hours a day, and they let you out for about an hour a day in an equally sized room, but it's outside where you can get fresh air. I remember going to the shower, which was like 10 feet away, they'd actually have you stick your hands through this trap door and they'd handcuff you, stick your legs or, or your feet through another door, they'd put uh, leg irons on you, they'd walk you 10 feet to another cell that was a shower, they'd lock you in there and then they'd take off the handcuffs, right? That's how high security it was. And after about eight and a half months, I started to get a little bit crazy. So the government went to my attorney and said, hey, we have a deal for your client. He pleads out. 12 months in custody, immediately we'll put him in a general population, we'll recommend Lompoc camp, which is like going on vacation, and it's a done deal. Or your client could fight, and we'll keep him in the hole, and uh, if he does get convicted and we sentence him, we're gonna ask that the judge keep him there in for a sentence. And so, what would any sane person do? I signed to get the hell out of there. So in 1990, I was released from uh, Lompoc camp, and uh, the camp was, uh, I was there for about four months. So I'm released, 1991, I get a phone call from my brother, my half-brother. And he says his girlfriend called him because she has a friend in San Diego named Eric Hines. And Eric always wanted to meet me, and he's a hacker himself, and he just wanted to see what I'm up to these days. And my brother warned me, he goes, I'd be careful because this, this girl that uh, I know isn't, uh, you know isn't that honorable. I go, well, what can it hurt to talk to this guy? So I called this other guy, I was given the phone number of this guy named uh, Henry Spiegel, who uh, was in Hollywood, and every time I wanted to get hold of Eric, I'd have to call Henry, 
to eventually that Eric gave me his pager number. And Eric was always asking, like probing questions, like, what are you up to these days? Who do you associate with? And I go, well, I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm just, you know, I'm just curious what you have to, what you, what you have to tell me. We decided to meet for dinner one night at a hamburger hamlet in LA. And he tells us about this system that Kevin Polson and him found called SAS. And with this system, you can secretly monitor anybody within PacBell service area. And you can even seize their dial tone. I mean, it was like this system that had hardly no security. And the power was you know, pretty compelling, especially when you could monitor data at 1,200 baud. So I go, wow, that's kind of interesting. Kind of piqued my interest, even though I was on supervised release and I was kind of out of the scene for about a year and a half. So I decided I was kind of suspicious about this guy, Eric. And I wanted to find out who he really was. So at the time, the PUC didn't tariff caller ID in California. You couldn't get it. The service was there, just couldn't get it. So since Pac Bell didn't implement it, I decided I would. So I got into the switch and I put caller ID on a friend's number in LA. And he had a device, and at 3.30 in the morning, I paged Eric to my friend's number, like a wrong number. Eric called it, and it displayed his number, and uh, I got it. Then I turned the caller ID off. So when I looked at that number through my phone freaking knowledge, I was able to determine what address that phone number worked at. It was the Oakwood Apartments in Los Angeles. So I call up the Oakwood management and I go, hey, this is Jerry over in Oakwood, uh, you know, Seattle. I have a, a, a customer who says that he, um, uh, he's already renting with you in Los Angeles and he's putting in an application over here and our system's down. Can you pull his rental application? So the nice lady on the other end of the phone pulls his rental application and proceeds to read me everything on the rental app. And when she got down to employment, there was only one phone number there, but it was listed as self-employment. I still remember the number, 213-507-7782. <laughs> and I go, that's interesting. I don't know that number. So I decide I'm going to pull the phone records. The cell phone, it was a cell phone. I was going to pull the records and to see you know, what interesting numbers I could find. Who is this guy? The other interesting thing is that number that I ID'd wasn't listed in the name of Eric Hines, but was in the name of Joseph Wernel. And I thought that was odd when one person lived in that apartment. So I pull the phone records, and immediately I find out something's wrong. I see this number on there over and over and over again, 310-477-6565. That number happens to be the, the telephone number for the Los Angeles headquarters of the FBI. Once I saw that, I knew something was very wrong. So then I start digging a little deeper, and I decide I was going to pull the social security records so I can find out where this Eric Hines had worked before. It's called a DECWI, and you can find out where somebody's worked since 1978. So I, I find out the mother's maiden name, the father's name, the, the birthplace was Pennsylvania for this guy, Joseph Wernel. And then I proceeded to find out, try to track down the parents. And the, par the mother's name was Mary Eberly, and the father's name, I think, was Joseph Wernel Sr. So I go on to some databases, and I find out another Joseph Wernel in the same city that uh, the Social Security record indicated was the father and the mother. And I call up, and I said, uh, yeah, may I speak to Mr. Wernel, please? So who's calling? Social Security Administration. Well, how can I help you? Well, I think we got a record skewed um, on this benefit ap application, and I'm just trying to straighten it out. Uh, may I speak to Mary Eberly, please? Oh, well, she's my sister. Oh, she's not your wife? No, she's my sister. I go, oh, okay. Uh, well, here's another person on here listed as Joseph Wernel. Who's that? He goes, well, that's me. I go, is there another Joseph Wernel that's uh, younger? He goes, no. I go, does Mary Eberly have a, a son? He goes, oh, yeah. Her son's name's Joseph, Joe Ways. But he's an FBI agent in LA. <laughs> oh, Joe Ways. So Joseph Wernel is a cover identity for Joe Ways. So then I knew something was very wrong. So in my, uh, I guess, my obsessive little behavior of finding out the answer to this uh, problematic question of who Eric Hines was, I decided I'm going to get DMV photographs. <laughs> so I, I call up Department of Motor Vehicles in, in Sacramento, and I give them the proper requester codes, and I have them fax over the driver's license photographs for Joseph Ways, Joseph Wernel, and Eric Hines. 
and I had them go to a Kinko's in Santa Monica. So they went ahead and faxed it, and it came out really grainy, and the fax was terrible. I couldn't see the pictures clearly. So I figured I'll try in a, another week and with another fax machine, probably be better. So I decided a week passes, and I figure I want to get those photographs again. So uh, I decided to go to a different, uh, different Kinko's in Studio City, California. So Christmas Eve, 1992, I show up at that Kinko's, and I go in, and it's super busy, and I'm really anxious just to get the photograph and get out of there. So I, I buy the counter, and nobody's there. So I figured, okay, I'll just grab the facts, I'll leave a couple bucks, and I'll be out of there, it's done. I don't want to wait. I go behind the counter, I go to the file and pull out the facts for the name that I used to request it from the DMV, and it was a picture of this old woman, like from a, like a textbook, and I'm pissed. Because I have somewhere to get go, I have to get to somewhere at a certain time, and now I have to call back these incompetent people at DMV because they screwed up. So I'm looking for a phone in the Studio City Kinko's, and I'm walking back and forth because there's no phone there for customer use, and I'm trying to contemplate what I should do. Little did I know, I had DMV investigators and FBI that were also in that Kinko's that were following me back and forth, <laughs> right? So I go out to the payphone outside when I got my thoughts together. I figured I'd call these people up and give them my two cents because they can't even fax over a photograph correctly. So I get on the payphone. I'm right outside the Kinko's, and I don't put a dime in, of course. I use a calling card, right? <laughs> Not on my calling card, but uh, I, um, <laughs> I call up uh, DMV, and all of a sudden, all these people in suits come out, and they're looking at me, and I'm holding the facts. So I go, yeah, can I help you? And they go, yeah, we're with the DMV. We want to have a conversation with you. And I hang up the phone, and I go, really? And I go, well, guess what? I don't want to have a conversation with you, and I threw the facts up. And I ran. <laughs> and you know, Stairmaster does wonders. I should do a commercial for Stairmaster because I used to do it every day, and uh, I beat them in the foot race. <laughs> yeah. So I figured that's a good time uh, to go underground. I figured that. Uh, something serious was going to happen with the, now I knew that Eric Hines was definitely either an FBI agent or an informant, and I knew that, uh, I knew I was a target. And at the time, I was really scared of being put into solitary confinement again, because if you're ever locked up in, in a room that's like, say, 10 by 6 for 23 hours a day for eight and a half straight months, you'd probably feel the same way. So I decided to change my name, and I moved to Denver, and I became Eric Weiss. <laughs> and I worked at a law firm. And you know, it's funny, does anyone know who Eric Weiss is? Yeah, Harry, Harry Houdini. I thought it was funny, the FBI didn't. <laughs> There's the theme of magic, it was an illusion, right? So I'm in, I'm, I'm in Denver, and I decided, hey, I'm, like, I'm on the run, my hobby's hacking, so what the hell, I have nothing to lose, I'm just gonna work by day, legitimately earn a living, and by night, I continue my hacking hobby. So I'll just, I'll just tell you the story of one of those, is uh, Motorola. I had a friend who was a, at, that worked in the law firm, and he had the brochure for the new Microtac Ultralight. And I thought, hey, this is a really cool cell phone. I'd like to know how it works, you know, because the hacker mine, it wasn't about I wanted to start up a competing company and call it Cabarola. I wanted to learn how this system worked. So what a better way than to get access to the firmware. So it was snowing in Denver that day, and I left the office around 3 p.m., and I lived on 16th Street in Denver. It's about a 17-minute walk from home. So I, I pick up my, my cell phone, which was a, a Novatel, and I call the 800 number from Motorola Corporation. The lady answers. I go, hey, this is Rick with engineering on Arlington Heights. Do you know how I can get hold of the Pacific subscriber group? The people that handle the cellular phone R&D? She goes, no, sir, but all our cellular phone stuff is handled out of Schaumburg, Illinois. I go, great, do you have that number? Oh, certainly, sir, it's 708 blah, 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 blah. Call, call that number. I go, hi, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. I'm trying to find who's, uh, who's project manager of the uh, Pan American Cellular Subscriber Group. 
She goes, well, hold on, sir. And I'm transferred around, transferred around. Finally, I get transferred to the vice president of R&D for cellular. I go, hey, how you doing? He goes, great, who's this? I go, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. I go, do you know who uh, works on the Microtech Ultralight Project? Well, that's Pam, she works for me. He goes, well, can I help you? I go, well, no, is there any way, can I talk to Pam? He goes, sure, her number is, you know, extension 2345. I go, great, thanks, have a great day. He goes, thank you, call ends. Next call, the Pam, that's extension 2345. Instead of getting Pam, I get a voicemail. Hi, this is Pam, I just left on vacation, I'll be back on July 29th. If you need any help, please call Alicia at extension blah, blah, blah. I go, wow, that's interesting, so I end the call. And I'm walking home in the snow, by the way. I call Alicia. I go, hi, Alicia. She goes, hi, who's this? I go, it's Rick over in Arlington Heights. How are you doing? She goes, great. I go, did Pam leave on vacation yet? Because I was supposed to talk to her, and, I don't, and she said she might be going, and I wasn't sure. She goes, oh, yeah, she left. So I go, wow. She was supposed to take care of something for me, but she said if she didn't have time to do it, that you would help me out, that you're the person to contact. She goes, yeah, how can I help you? I go, well, do you know where the latest revision of the firmware for the Microtech Ultralight, do you know where that is on the server? She goes, well, I work in development. I said, well, she doesn't know, I don't know where it is, but I'll find it for you. So she was looking around on the different systems and found a script in Pam's account that actually extracted the, uh, the latest source code release and put it into a directory on her local machine. She goes, oh, okay, okay, what, what do you want me to do next? And I go, well, do you know how to use like uh, tar and gzip? She goes, what's that? I go, well, let me show you. So I walk her through the steps of taking the whole source code tree and making one nice little file that's tarred in gzip. I go, great, well, you know what would help me a lot, Pam, if you can transfer that file to me? She goes, sure, how do I do it? I go, do you know of a program called FTP? <laughs> she goes, yeah, that's file transfer program. I said, precisely. And I'm thinking as I'm walking, I never expected this to work. This was all extemporaneous. So I'm thinking, where can I have a transfer to that doesn't go back to Eric Weiss or Kevin Mitnick or anything? So I remembered I knew an account at Colorado Supernet, which was an ISP in Denver, and I remembered the, uh, uh, I remembered the account name and password. I also remembered the IP address, thank God, because I was thinking, giving this lady to FTP the source code to you know, supernet.colorado.edu would have been you know, a big red flag. So instead I say, okay, I'm gonna, have you open up an FTP session, and she types FTP, I go, okay, open, and I give her the IP address. And it just sits there, dead as a doornail. She goes, it's not working. She goes, maybe this could be a security-related issue. I go, really? And she goes, yeah, let me put you on hold. I'm gonna talk to my security administrator. I go, no, 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 and she puts me on hold. <laughs> and I'm ready to hit the end button on the phone, right? And uh, she comes back five minutes later, she said she couldn't get hold of the security administrator, but she spoke to the system administrator, and it is a security issue. And since the file is being transferred outside of Motorola's campus, you have to use a special proxy server. But he was kind enough to give me the username, password to the proxy server. <laughs> I'm looking at my phone, I go, can this be real? <laughs> so by the time I put my key into the front door, I had Motorola's source code for that firmware sitting on an anonymous account at Colorado Supernet, right? Yeah, Motorola definitely uh, wasn't happy about that one. <laughs> so later on I moved to Seattle, and I'm just gonna give you some highlights, because I um, want to get uh, through this in an hour and a half. And one day I am walking down the street, this is on Brooklyn Avenue in Seattle, in the U District, and I pull out my cell phone, which by the way was a cloned cell phone, I changed the ESN phone number every day, and walking down the street, I see this like military helicopter, and it looks like it's gonna land in the school campus over here, and the school was closed. So I sit there, I pull it out, and I'm walking down, I make a, initiate a phone call, and all of a sudden this helicopter stops and starts coming down. <laughs> and I go, I go, no, right? So I ran, turned off the cell phone, I went a couple blocks away, I go, this can't be real, right? I turn on the cell phone, and all of a sudden I hear, do 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 I'm going, no, this can't be real. Turn off the cell phone again, and I go three blocks in some other direction. I turn it on. Do 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 do
they stuck their floppy disk between you know, the two uh, openings on the uh, computer system and didn't get in the floppy drive right and I'd have to go take it out. So I quit that job and I was at Kinko's working on my resume and I was sitting there listening to the uh, secret service frequencies. And I'm listening to the surveillance or waiting for this guy at this somewhere in Seattle and they're sitting there and I'm listening and this lady next to me goes, she goes, what are you listening to? I go, oh, that's the U.S. Secret Service. They're about to bust somebody tonight. She goes, really? Oh, yeah. I go, but that guy's going to have a bad day. And we're both laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so then I heard one of the agents go out that said, maybe he's at the computer store. And then right away, I'm listening for that. The, those then I get interested in the conversation, right? So a few hours later, I'm done working on my resume to get it printed on the ivory linen and stuff. And then I decide to walk on the opposite side of the street, home. I walk in the opposite side. I see a van sitting in front of the apartment, two people in there. I go around the block. And I notice my lights were off in my apartment. And that was kind of strange. So, but the manager's light on the second level was on, so it wasn't a power failure. So eventually, I got enough guts to go up to the manager's, and they knocked on his door. This is like after midnight. And I go, hey, this is Brian. I had a new name, Brian Merrill. He's not a magician, by the way. And um, I go, did you let someone in my apartment? He goes, no, but they let themselves in, Secret Service, FBI, and Seattle Police. And oh, by the way, they said they want you to call them when you get home. <laughs> I go, oh, really? I go, do you have the phone number? He goes, no, but they left you a business card. Down okay, I'll go right to it. Needless to say, I decided not to go to my apartment, and I left Seattle. Yeah. I had abandoned all my stuff, too. So let's fast forward. And there's a lot of stuff to tell, but I can't uh, bore, the, bore you guys with everything. Let's go into 1995. Um, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I remember talking to Emmanuel the night before my bust. We were talk I was talking to him. I called him up to say hello, to let him know how I was doing. And unbeknownst to me, Satomu Shimomura and John Markoff of the New York Times was eavesdropping on that communication. So around 1.30 in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, I got a knock on the door. And I just got done working out at the gym. And to me, it felt like 9 in the, nine in the evening. It didn't feel like 1.30 in the morning. And without even thinking, I go, who is it? FBI. Oh, no. I go to the phone. I call my mom. I call my grandmother. I call my lawyer and say, hey, I'm in North Carolina, and the FBI is at my door. I think something's wrong. So. I go, who is, what do you want? Are you Kevin Mitnick? No, man. Do you guys check the mailboxes? I'm Brian. You got the wrong door. I'm asleep. We'll come back later. OK, they go away for about 10 minutes. Come back. <laughs> Knock again. Yes. Can we talk to you for a moment, sir? What do you want now? Well, we really want to talk to you. It's really important. I figured I'd crack the door, I'd crack the door, and boosh, about 12 people end up in my studio apartment. They go, sir, are you Kevin Mitnick? I go, I just told you no. Do you have any identification, sir? Yes, absolutely. And I pull out my new North Carolina driver's license with a new name on it, my picture, of course. And um, the FBI agent examines it closely. He goes, well, sir, you just got this about two weeks ago. OK, yeah, it's the law in North Carolina when you move. You have to get, you, know, you have to change your residency, you have to get a new license. He goes, well, where are you from? I go, Nevada. So then the agents start searching around my apartment. And they go, excuse me, are you looking through my stuff? And he goes, yeah. And I go, do you have a warrant? And they hand me this piece of paper that says US, US v. Kevin Mitnick, no address. I go, I go, first of all, I'm not this Mitnick guy. And second of all, this doesn't look like a search warrant. I mean, it doesn't have an address. He goes, no, it's a, it's, it's a search, sir. And I go, no, you're not searching here. And I get my attorney on the phone. I go, and I go, hi, John. This is, a bra you know, what I think Len is the name I was using. And uh, he talks to the agent, and he demands to get a search warrant. So they all, so the case agent left. But this one agent decides he's going to go through my briefcase. And I knew that I didn't want him to go through my briefcase because of something I had in there, other identity stuff. So as he's looking through my briefcase, I go up, and I slam it shut, and I lock it. And he goes, he gets very angry. And he goes, you open this up right now or else I'm breaking into it. I said, I can't stop you from breaking into it, but I'm not opening it. 
And of course they never did because they would need a search warrant to open it. So eventually, about an hour and a half later, they're searching, I'm yelling at them to get the F out of my apartment, and, and I'm not this Mitnick guy. So they handed me, they, they got all in a circle and put me in the middle of the circle, and they had this piece of paper they were looking at, and it was a U.S. Marshal's Most Wanted poster with my picture on it. <laughs> so, but I looked different. I had a mustache, I had very long hair, I could easily fluctuate my weight to change my looks. So I didn't look anything like the picture. So they hand it to me, they go, doesn't this look like you? So of course I take it and study it. What do you think I'm going to say, right? I say, no, it doesn't look, at me, look, at me, look at, like me at all. And they go, that after 15 minutes, they're confused. And they go, well, sir, frankly, we don't know if you're Kevin Mitnick, but we want to do something. We want to take you down to our FBI office and fingerprint you, and we'll do a fingerprint comparison. I said, why didn't you guys think of this earlier? Why do you put me through this three hours of this shenanigan when you could have just fingerprinted me? In fact, why don't we schedule an appointment tomorrow morning at 10 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> They weren't having that. They figured they wanted those fingerprints now. So in the middle of all that, an agent was searching my closet, found a leather jacket, and the leather jacket was a wallet. And he pulled out the wallet, and I tried to stop him, but I wasn't going to touch a federal agent, of course. And he pulled out these identities with my picture in different names. He goes, what's this? I go, oh, those are my alternate personalities. <laughs> They're, then they arrested me. Then they knew, right? No sense of humor. So at that time, I was the proud winner of the scapegoat sweepstakes. And that's where I led through my, uh, my long journey through the uh, federal criminal system. Uh, immediately, I was labeled a computer terrorist by the DOJ, um, you know, the Osama bin Mitnick of the Internet. And I, I held some records. I was first placed into solitary confinement in, in a county jail in North Carolina. And I was forbidden, I was held incommunicado. And after about a week, my attorneys in Los Angeles negotiated a deal that if I waived, essentially waived all my rights, that they would let me out of the hole. And I'd only be allowed to call certain people. So I figured, do I want to spend, do I want to be in the hole for months more or do I want to get in the general population and waive the rights? Well, I waived the rights, I signed. And then I ended up being held, it's kind of, it's, it's a long story, but I'm only going to cover the highlights, for about four and a half years without a bail hearing, which is actually unconstitutional because everyone that's arrested and accused of any offense is allowed to get a hearing in front of a neutral and detached decision maker. And this is where both sides have the opportunity to determine, uh, to prove to a neutral decision maker whether there's any condition or combination of conditions that will reasonably assure that the person will appear at trial. And the judge in my case was so poisoned against me because you know, I could launch nuclear missiles by whistling into a telephone that she decided it wasn't necessary to have a hearing. And we took it all the way up to the US Supreme Court. And Justice John Paul Stevens thought it was very, a very interesting issue and he referred it to the full court for a hearing, but I didn't get enough votes. So unfortunately, the Supreme Court pretty much turned their back on the case which happens to a lot of people. So the first record I set was the longest held in pretrial detention, the longest held without a bail hearing, the first defendant to use a laptop in prison. And the laptop was an interesting issue because for my attorney to prepare an adequate defense, he needed access to the evidence. Well, what evidence do you have against my client? Well, it's all computer-based evidence, right? And my attorney wasn't a computer expert. None of the computer experts that he found were knowledgeable enough at the time to really analyze and dissect the evidence. So he needed my help in explaining to him what was important and what wasn't. So he argued for years to allow him, his, his uh, assistants at the office, and myself to be able to review the evidence together. The government, I remember Christopher Painter, he's now the uh, chief of uh, CSIPS, he argued to the judge if you give Mitnick a standalone computer in custody that he can and probably will write a worm or a virus and somehow it's going to find its way off that standalone laptop and wreak havoc upon the free world. <laughs> Not only that, we believe that he could engineer an escape with a standalone laptop. 
And I'm thinking to myself, how can they get away with this? In fact, I'll tell you a funny story that just came to mind. As I was so, like, I couldn't believe the, the excuses or the arguments that the judge was buying into. So I figured, the judge needs to hear somebody, uh, somebody with a credible background, somebody that's well known in the media that she wouldn't believe would BS her or try to pull the wool over her eyes. So I have a friend, three, I, I find the uh, phone number to Steve Wozniak. And I, I call information over the phone and I didn't find a Steve, I found a Gary listed. So I had my friend on a Sunday morning three-way in the number. I figured, I'll, I'll ask him. Maybe he'd be kind enough to come to court and he could set the judge straight. So uh, I called up and some, uh, some young, young guy answered. And I go, hey, is Steve there? And he got on the phone. And I go, hi. And he goes, oh, it's Sunday morning. I'm, I'm, I'm really busy. I can't talk right now. And then I, I felt embarrassed that I was bothering him. So I just said, OK, bye. And I, and I, and I hung up the phone. So that was my, uh, I guess, first time that I met Steve <laughs> over the telephone. So never, I was never able to uh, find somebody that would have been credible uh, in the court's eyes. So what ended up is I had a wave. I was put in the position of waiving my speedy trial rights over and over again. And how I was put in that position is you have a right to a speedy trial under the Constitution and under statutory law, but a defendant could waive that right. And the defendant has a choice. You either go to trial with ineffective counsel that doesn't have any sense of the evidence, or you give your attorney time to prepare an adequate defense. And since my attorney had no access to the discovery, I was put into the position, well, you could, you could stand on your rights, Mr. Mitnick, and go to trial immediately, and your attorney has no sense of the evidence you're going to lose, or I waive my trial, speedy trial rights over and over.